Good afternoon. Hope everybody enjoyed lunch. So we're going to have a, a conversation today about uh, where we may go with uh, Genie's wireless research infrastructure. Um, I think the, the basic story here is that the Genie WiMAX deployment, which ha is in place, has been in place, um, you know, in more or less its current state for uh, about a year now, has been really proving to be one of the great success stories of Genie, and perhaps in a, in a way we hadn't uh, quite predicted. And this is something that we should uh, make sure we, we continue and, and build upon. There's some obvious uh, issues, the most notable of which is that I said WiMAX when I said the Genie WiMAX uh, deployment, and that's probably not the technology we want to continue to build our, our research infrastructure upon. So we're going to have a little bit of a conversation today. I'm going to lay out uh, some suggestions as to uh, what we might do. We're going to have some of the folks who have been uh, doing such successful uh, research in our current WiMAX deployment sort of help uh, sample the, the research space, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the design of, of a, a better, uh, bigger, better uh, Genie Wireless research infrastructure going forward. So we've got, what, 90 minutes to accomplish all that? That sounds like a, a pretty good uh, challenge, so I'll try not to be too verbose. I'm doing something terribly wrong with my computer, but I can't see the slides, so I'm gonna have to come around here and peek a little bit. So I think nobody in this room, and, and probably nobody who's you know, been around anything vaguely high tech for the past few years, uh, questions that the world is moving towards wireless. You can't tell a networking research story that is entirely wired. There's just so, too much of uh, service delivery that's tied up in wireless platforms. And thinking pre-Genie, uh, and this is you know, very recent times, doing network research in novel uh, services has been very, very hard because essentially you're working with uh, closed, commercially run cellular systems. So everybody knows test tube guy, test tube guy, has a great idea, and he is confronted by the, the cynics, the doubters, who would like to see it actually working. And this has been the story with Genie all along, that we're trying to change this dynamic so that when you have a novel idea, you're not stuck. You have some place to go. So Genie WiMAX has been very successful in letting us go the next step so that I can take this concept, I can try it out, uh, in real, you know, operational, multi-city, genuine cellular deployment. And GDE WiMAX is providing the only opportunity that exists uh, for researchers to do that now uh, in the US. And we've been getting a great set of research results out of that. And I'm not gonna read you the list. Instead, what we're gonna do is have um, three or four of the folks who've been doing this work uh, come up and give you a little bit of summary about the progress they've made. But this work is you know, across a, a wide set of areas, and it's both in uh, research and educational applications. There's just some great stuff going on. So you know, I, I said that maybe we'd been a little bit more successful than we had anticipated. And you know, that sort of begs the question of, of why. You know, why has uh, the Genie WiMAX deployment uh, worked out so well? And I think really there's been this um, sort of set of counterbalancing forces, right? One is the, the desire to be able to conduct uh, arbitrary research, do anything you want uh, from you know, the, the network protocols down to the waveforms and you know, have full, uh, full research ability. And, the other is the practical realities of living within the restrictions placed upon us by the availability of spectrum, by the requirement to work with uh, the existing commercial operators. You simply can't do um, everything you want. So I, you know, I think that 
stumbling around a little bit, we came to a very nice sweet spot uh, in our current YMAX deployment. We're building on commercial infrastructure. We've managed to work with uh, first Clearwire and now, uh, now Sprint Clearwire uh, to come to a, a good master agreement on licensing spectrum uh, so that Gini researchers conduct their work using real spectrum, using real devices without uh, running into conflict with the, the owners of the commercial spectrum in that space. We've got standard packages for rolling out uh, gene deployment, and we've integrated with some really nice uh, tools coming out of Orbit and other, uh, other uh, projects. And as a result, we've got a really nice, you know, a, a nice operational uh, research system. It's not perfect. Uh, there's, some, there's some definite gaps. Uh, one you know, sort of amusing uh, paradox that you run into when thinking about uh, mobility research is, well, mobility research is actually location specific, right? You, you can't simply SSH into a computer that is located uh, somewhere across the country and have the research be just the same. You actually need to have infrastructure uh, that's reasonably local. So we need to be supporting research um, at more sites, and there's some specifically interesting kinds of coverage uh, we'd like to make sure we emphasize. We do need to transition from WiMAX to LTE, and then we need to make sure that we're not just emphasizing the research in this sweet spot I was just talking about, which is a very rich spot, okay, but we also want to uh, emphasize, let's say, research both above and below that level. Uh, so above that level, um, you'll hear Jim talk a little bit about SciWinet. SciWinet is, is you know, a great uh, researcher-friendly uh, MPNO that gives you uh, data transport in a way that makes sense for, for research projects. Uh, you don't need to go down and, and mess with uh, the underlying protocols. And then for the people who, who really can't make do with working on mostly unmodified uh, commercial hardware, we do need to make sure we come up with the right solutions for supporting the sort of lower level uh, wireless infrastructure research. And there, there are some solutions there. I think Yvonne and Rob will talk about uh, those some in their talks. And we need to be, you know, make sure we're supporting uh, that work as well. You know, so this sort of implies a relatively obvious uh, three-pronged approach. We want to continue to rely on a SciWinet, a SciWinet like model for supporting data transport. We want to significantly expand uh, the current Gini wireless infrastructure to support more locations and to move to LTE. We don't think we're fundamentally changing the operational model here. We want to use as many existing Gini sites, places that already have Gini racks, as the nucleation points uh, for this research infrastructure. Uh, that's what we've been doing so far with WiMAX, and it's an approach that works. We'd like to look at the existing and emerging uh, low-level wireless test beds for those who do need to get uh, under the hood and do lower-level research. And we want to start doing all of this pretty much now. And we need to, particularly, that we need to tra uh, time the transition to LTE to fit in with the commercial deployments that are happening. Uh, you know, as soon as uh, Sprint starts making serious uh, moves from WiMAX to LTE, we look a lot more like noise to them. Uh, we'd like to make sure we look like well-synchronized spectrum sharing signal uh, instead of noise. Again, a funny look. Oh, not a funny look. Okay. So here's the proposal for the, uh, the middle layer of this infrastructure. So we currently have, I believe it's 13, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 13, right, 13 sites, uh, 26 uh, base stations in the uh, Gini WiMAX infrastructure. We'd like to scale that up to the about 50 sites, about 100 uh, base stations infrastructure that would basically be put one of these everywhere we have a Gini rack. Switch to LTE, building on um, existing airspan commercial uh, base stations. The price point is pretty good on these. This is not a tremendous uh, hardware investment. Connect everybody up to Genie Racks and the Genie Backbone so you can conduct wide area experiments. 
and continue to you know, build upon standard uh, mobile devices for uh, the end user access. That's essentially the plan, although I'd like to point out that uh, Rob and Yvonne and Jim are going to augment sort of the, the, the sandwich part, the, the bread parts of that sandwich. Any questions before we move on? Is this the post-lunch enthusiasm I was expecting? <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you. Hello everybody, so I'm uh, Jim Martin from Clemson University. Um, I am actually working with KC on a, um, our Clemson Genie WiMAX uh, project. And so if, if you come by our demo this evening, I can tell you uh, more about the, the handoff um, solution that we're putting together um, using our WiMAX uh, and Wi-Fi open flow systems on campus. Um, so today, this is meant to be a um, really an overview of SciWiNet. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with, with SciWiNet. Some of you may not, um, but I'll sort of move rapidly here in the introductory um, summarization of the project and, and really, get to um, the, the last slide, which talks about moving forward and, and lessons learned. Um, and, and Mark, how, how do you want to handle like discussions? Should we wait until the very end? So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> okay, so conceptually, SciWiNet is, is pretty straightforward. Basically, we're, uh, we're, we're an MVNO, a mobile virtual network operator. We're reselling uh, 3G and 4G data services. Um, and MVNO uh, is uh, a, we, we uh, try and have a very focused user community. So that's, what MVNO's attempt to do. So our user community is the, the uh, academic uh, research community that needs uh, in some way, shape, or form to be able to do um, their research out in the wild. So they require um, uh, data connectivity in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, there's obviously lots of uh, uh, a very broad scope in terms of the academic research community, right? So us, we're, we're the wireless researchers or, or networking researchers, but more broadly, there are 
the non-CS, non-ECE uh, folks. There are uh, the, the civil engineers. There's the, the application domains focus um, research communities. So the, the smart grid, the uh, intelligent transportation systems. There's healthcare, um, dot, dot, dot. Um, so the goal of, of this project is to uh, provide or to make it easier for the research community to access uh, wireless networks um, uh, on a, on a uh, large scale. Okay, so the motivations for SciWiNet, um, Mark actually touched on them when he was talking about the, the evolution of Genie WiMAX, right? So the, um, it's uh, the, the requirements of the academic research community are, are very diverse. Right now we have Genie WiMAX, which is um, a, provides uh, a, a large scale uh, wireless network that gives us fine grain control of the underlying networking system. Um, and that's actually the exception, right? So historically, most uh, wireless research out in the field has been limited to uh, Wi-Fi or um, networking wireless technologies that require or use unlicensed spectrum. So one way to, to think of um, SciWiNet from the Genie context is we're attempting to um, focus on the scalability issues uh, in a slightly different way than, than what G the Genie WiMAX or wireless direction is, um, is going down. So even if, even if their WiMAX technology is evolved uh, towards LTE, which is great, um, SciWiNet then provides scale with respect to geographic footprints or with respect to uh, uh, variety of devices. And the way we do that is by partnering with uh, cellular operators. So <clears throat> the, the figure here attempts to at least uh, let me talk through the pieces of SciWiNet. Um, so SciWiNet is the, 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 the cloud, so to speak. But underneath, um, we're actually working with a company called Artera. Artera is a business partner of, of Sprint and T-Mobile and potentially other wireless operators. Uh, Artera, uh, to some degree, their job is to start up MVNOs, and that's what they did for us. So they provide us basically the, the, the management system to be able to support our users. So in other words, SciWiNet is, is the face of our MVNO, and Artera and its underlying network operators are the actual infrastructure providers. Um, OK, so uh, as, as you can see, the model here is that researchers would, um, uh, would have access to SciWiNet's wireless system, and I'll talk in more detail about exactly the, the look and feel of, um, from a researcher's perspective, how one goes about getting access to SciWiNet. OK. Um, so let, let, me, let me also try and uh, reel in here our specific project. So, you know, the, 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 the big picture is we, we want a MVNO, a wireless network that's available to the academic community. Okay, so we're, we're not there yet. We're, we're in basically phase one of our project. So phase one is um, a, uh, a, an exploratory research project. We are in the process of understanding the user community requirements. Uh, and some other objectives associated with this phase of our project um, is to continue working with Genie and 
um, leverage what Genie WiMAX and Genie Project itself has had, um, uh, and 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 basically look to see how we can take advantage of both sides of the project, um, make available SciWiNet to other researchers. So, in other words, the Genie community is one set of users for SciWiNet, and um, we are uh, SciWiNet supports um, LTE wherever Sprint has deployed LTE. So therefore, um, we, we uh, really are, uh, SciWiNet is appropriate for researchers that are um, interested in wireless connectivity for not just wireless or networking purposes, as I, I said before. So in our um, specific objectives here for phase one, we want to better understand device requirements. We want to understand the, the current model that we present to our customers. We call it the bucket model. So basically, uh, researchers can um, uh, access or acquire uh, any number of devices, and their data time is uh, they would consume a single bucket of data. And this is different than the, um, the, the basically pre-purchase on a monthly basis data per device. Uh, so it's more of a purchase data as you need data shared across any number of devices. There's actually other options that, that might be appropriate for other types of research. So for example, one of the issues that we're working through with a, a, a project that we're talking with is um, an Internet of Things type model. So what if there are literally tens of thousands of devices in a geographic area? So does this bucket model scale to that level? It's probably not as well as it could, although there's room for uh, negotiations with our partners, Artera and their, their operators. So in other words, a part of this project is to iron out um, the appropriate models that we uh, make available to our, our users. Okay, um, also experimentation models. So there's the, the slice model. Is that, is that appropriate for this user community? Um, there's the shared device pool model. So should we acquire a large set of devices and make those available to Two more slides here. We send out to, to that uh, really clear wires WiMAX network um, uh, web Researcher where we had larger group of users.
users would can do allow us to do mobile experimentation at scale um, and scale here uh, we I think in the wireless world we should think of it a little differently from uh, you know the scale in the wired context um, we, we we probably need to focus on density of, uh, of use users uh, so it Three base stations. Um, but if you think of uh, scale in the wireless context, you know the challenges come in when you have lots of users in the same area sharing the same spectrum. 
uh, number of base station, handoffs happening, so proximity is key, and you know, it, it issues are different when you're in a completely urban setting versus rural setting. So we have to kind of look at density as an important metric for uh, wireless experimentation. Um, second important criteria is to have a group of real users. That's been a focus of Genie for a while, so that's something that we obviously want to have. And then the suitable le level of programmability. Okay, so these are sort of, sort of the goals. And if I think of the infrastructure that we are striving to build today, there are kind of a progression. There's no one right answer for every kind of research. Um, at, on one extreme, you have a highly programmable uh, sort of software-defined radio platforms which allow you to do experimentation in the FIMAC uh, kind of uh, mechanisms. Um, in some cases, they can be pretty expensive, and therefore it's hard to kind of generate them at large scale, and it's hard to also get lots of real users running on these systems. Uh, the second potential, which is sort of what the Gini uh, WiMAX uh, effort has kind of focused on, is uh, highly or somewhat configurable um, hardware. You, you may not be able to reprogram the Phi and the Mac, um, you know, not, not a, in a large way. Um, and then you can sort of leverage standard base stations, sort of leverage standard clients, and then some sort of, you know, large scale and real users are possible on such an infrastructure. And then the third example is what uh, uh, Jim was talking about, which I, I kind of classify that as sort of commercial off-the-shelf uh, systems. It has its big advantages that it, it can easily generate a nationwide footprint because you have Sprint or somebody backing up such a MVNO. Um, but of course, it has limited configurability. And each of these infrastructures allow certain kinds of research and certain kinds of tasks to be easily implemented. So the focus I want, to, I, the, the part I want to personally focus on is the second one where the current Genie WiMAX model where you have somewhat configurable hardware and you still enable uh, lots of base stations um, and clients to exist. So, um, and you know, trying to paint the picture that we are looking at the need for high density of users and users. We want scale. Uh, I kind of think of Planet Lab as very large scale in some ways, but of course it's a different world out there. Um, and then real users. So we want to kind of bring all of these three things together. So um, what, what is this uh, outdoor city-wide wireless infrastructure? So we really want to almost build like a mini cellular operator running in at least a city uh, or at least a large part of a city. And that can be very compelling because today if I, um, you know, with the WiMAX base stations we have, if I go to my students in the university and say, you know, I'll give you a cell phone for free that can work on WiMAX that we will build and provide for you, uh, they will like it, but it's still limited, you know, within a couple of square miles, and they can find some use cases, but they'll have to carry their other phone all the time anyways. So it's not always as easy to get tons of users, but it's still good. So the question is, can we expand from what we have today to a larger size so that people can really feel that, yes, I can kind of carry a mobile device with me, and that gives me coverage, and I can use it sort of and depend on it uh, in a larger extent than possible today. So. An important uh, kind of development that's been happening over the last, I would say, one year, and I know some of the folks from this room had visited me, uh, visited us in Madison, and uh, had a chance to introduce you to the, uh, some of the local uh, parties involved. So there's a couple of local organizations. Uh, one of them is a local ISP called Five Nines. And we, in partnership with them, we are basically trying to see if we can build out a larger footprint of WiMAX infrastructure across Madison. And so this is sort of a map of, uh, you know, large parts of Madison, and uh, the campus, UW-Madison campus is where that, uh, close to that uh, red circle is, and kind of close by, the green uh, square next to it is our, uh, one of our base stations, and you can see some of the other base stations are marked. But we want to build out more base stations across the city so that you have a much more wider footprint, and we want to cover as significant parts of downtown and uh, neighboring parts of the city as possible with this infrastructure. Now, the advantage of partnering with such organizations is that, you know, Five Nines is an ISP. They already own and uh, has the ability to set up a lot of infrastructure on rooftops because they have hardware that sits on rooftops. They have fiber running to these positions, and uh, they can provide a lot of support. I mean, they have a lot of interest just to ensure interesting research and connectivity in, in Madison. So they are a very willing partner, and one of the other things they are actually doing for us is they are donating the WiMAX base stations to us because um, there was an operator before who wanted to deploy WiMAX across the city and then abandoned the plants and then the hardware just was sitting around and so we were able to uh, take advantage of it. So this is sort of uh, one, one kind of uh, small step towards this direction. Um, 
So if we have a footprint of that nature, I, I believe we can kind of come up with kind of many interesting uses. Uh, one of the use cases we have been uh, working in Madison um, is this project called Wire Over, where we allow different kinds of vehicles to connect to various types of wireless infrastructure, including the WiMAX infrastructure. Uh, and we work with local city buses and long distance buses and taxis and ambulances and so on. Of course, the, their connectivity through WiMAX is much limited right now because probably a mile or mile and a half when they are within the path of these base stations and then they're out of the range and they go and connect to uh, you know, commercial cellular. Uh, so it's not a pure WiMAX based um, infrastructure that they uh, get to use. And you know, here are some nice pictures from our demo. So we, we do kind of interesting things with our infrastructure. Uh, we, we now, on city buses, we mount these uh, screens where you can post ads and images and kind of uh, do some interesting things so students can also kind of uh, participate in them. And these are some uh, people you probably know who were there when we were doing the demos in uh, the GC17. Um, the other kind of use case, if you have a wider deployment where students and faculty may be able to uh, roam around the city and still stay connected on a, some sort of an infrastructure, is that you can probably provide controlled access to some limited communities. Now, a very important thing that will come up when you kind of pretend to be a mini operator is that, as you know, with a lot of uh, you know, le legislation that's happened in this space is you can't really pretend to be an operator. You, you can't be an operator. You can't be charging people for services. You can't be giving services to people for free. But um, as a university, there are opportunities where we can make services available to our own community. So if you just think of the UW community, you know, that's 40,000 people, uh, we can limit it in a controlled way to a lot of these people and uh, create targeted apps and services, which you know, a campus typically always provides as part of its uh, infrastructure. So we can kind of work in that context in some ways. Um, so we are kind of working out some initial plans around this. Uh, we have, uh, the plan is roughly to kind of partner with, uh, say, Five Nines. And there's actually a couple of other organizations, including the city of Madison, which is interested in sort of uh, forming so, some sort of loose collaboration. The exact nature of it is still not clear. But, uh, you know, Five Nines, so we want to actually have to integrate uh, base stations and hardware we install in different networks and manage it centrally in a very nice, uh, uh, careful framework. We want to provide compute resources with each base station, so something like an open flow switch plus a compute server rack sitting with each base station so somebody can potentially load some programmability deep into the network. And if I can put one with every base station, it really enables new kinds of things you can do on a reasonably large footprint of, let's say, 30 to 40 square mile area around a you know, city, which will be a lot of fun to uh, different experimenters. You can do different kinds of handoffs and things like that. Uh, so it brings together all these different entities in this effort. Now, upgrade to LTE, I think, you know, of course, um, right now we have access to WiMAX hardware both in the Gini context and through the uh, arrangement we have with, uh, with Five Nines, uh, who have donated us some uh, WiMAX hardware. Uh, but uh, we, of course, don't right now have our LTE platform that we can deploy. Um, there's been discussions, and I know a lot of people here are aware of, uh, where airspan base stations potentially can be software upgraded or firmware upgraded to LTE. Of course, that requires a lot of other work to happen in, in, in tandem. Um, but I believe that if we want to see this vision of a citywide wireless infrastructure, I think some of the hard work has been done. And they have, they, it's not always, the equipment is not always the most expensive part, as we all know, right? It's only you know, 10K, 15K a base station. I can buy a bunch of them with a, even a modest grant. But the hard part is management, support, access to rooftops, and these are really, really uh, expensive sort of uh, uh, properties. You know, no city will have, uh, you know, it, it, when we tried to do this in, in university setting, we were trying to set up this WiMAX base station. It took us a long time just because of all the bureaucracy and other things uh, around it. Um, but because we have this partner, you know, they have access to rooftops, they have access to a lot of other uh, backhaul fiber and all the other resources. So I think we want to piggyback on that, and e equipment will only be a small part of this. So just to uh, wrap up, I have a couple more slides. Um, uh, users, I, I think we can potentially bring a limited group of users, as limited as we want to be. We, we may not want to bring on all 40,000 students, maybe a small fraction, maybe computer science and electrical engineering students or some kinds of faculty. And you know, grow it as, as we see fit. Uh, we can incorporate some of the student dorms in it because they uh, go through campus networks. Uh, we can also work with public utilities and um, you know, public safety services uh, with this network because they have shared interests. 
And you know, one of the very attractive areas in Madison is what's uh, the area called State Street. If you've been there uh, during GEC 17, you'll uh, seen it. It's very highly popular, lots of restaurants, a lot of people hang out, lots of activities go on there. So if you can do something interesting around that area, I think it can open up uh, interesting possibilities and in turning this almost into a living lab. Uh, that's one of the things that I'm very excited to explore further. Um, and you know, there are some detailed ideas we can talk offline on. So of course, there's lots of resources. So I think I'll stop there. But I believe uh, that we really uh, can potentially think of this one model where you have a few locations where you have this larger wireless infrastructure for research purposes, which is somewhat stable so people can actually use it, but you can deploy some experimental services. Anybody can deploy experimental services on top of it. And you can get some level of configurability and you know, ability to change the software behaviors. Um, and it sits sort of between the two extremes of high programmability at PyMac and completely commercial systems that, um, that we can also envision. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Are we taking any questions? I guess if anybody has one or, oh, okay. What I do is I first briefly talk about our current project where we use WiMAX to as a basic enabler of uh, network research in those uh, what we call the Simpson control systems. And then I'll briefly share some thoughts on how potentially the LTE may help us in those efforts. Also, how we may want to rethink about our strategy on LTE deployment. So uh, here's um, the deployment uh, on our campus in Midtown, Detroit. Uh, we have a few base stations deployed on the rooftop of our department building. And right now, the, the coverage is, is something like this in terms of downlink capacity and uplink capacity. For essentially our base station, the base station is run in this area. And then we kind of cover most of the, the majority of the campus part. And then for some part of the campus, the capacity is actually quite good, up to 28 meg DPS. But for the highways around us, um, the rate is a little bit lower, uh, so, so that may be something we can probably benefit from the future uh, LTE deployment. So in terms of the use cases, we look at three uh, basic uh, categories of use cases. One is to sort of use a YMX as a way of integrating the uh, vehicular sensing platforms into the Gini backbone so that uh, folks can experiment with uh, vehicular sensing in terms of both internal sensing and, uh, and external sensing. For example, seeing what the engine speed, fuel consumption, as well as seeing what the, the environment is. So that's one aspect of the use case. The second aspect is actually to uh, enable at scale high fidelity emulation because unlike other wireless network systems, such as sensor networks, it's pretty difficult for each individual group to run thousands of vehicles uh, as, they, as they wish uh, in, real, in real world settings. So there's a benefit of kind of have a small scale deployment on campus, and then integrate that with large scale emulation at the Gini Cloud, for example, the Gini Rex, using Gini Rex. So that's a second use case. And uh, a third use, use case is actually for, for our collaborators. Uh, basically, uh, I mentioned briefly the campus deployment. Uh, we actually use a police patrol vehicles as well, uh, deploying our emulation system, the client part of our emulation system. So here's something that could be actually actually motivated to help with us 
Uh, that is, we can actually, uh, I'm working with a, a colleague in kind of vision systems, uh, looking to how we can use the cameras deployed on campus as, as well as cameras on patrol vehicles to enable kind of 3D uh, uh, clues of the environment, so the campus, when they are, for example, when some event happens, they can easily actually correlate with another, one another, and have a kind of global, global view about what's happening on campus. Um, so now, so I guess I was asked to talk about what are the, you know, how can we benefit potential from LTE deployment. So I think probably we can think in terms of both in immediate and long-term impact. Uh, first of all, as I also mentioned, I think earlier by Mark, you know, LTE is clearly wins in the marketplace for traditional consumer electronics. So if we can ha have LTE, then so it's more compatible with uh, sort of the day-to-day -day device we use, like smartphones. This would enable other uh, researchers, such as uh, folks in the medical school, to use uh, some of the resources we can we actually have on campus. Um, for YMX, we you know they are very reluctant to actually use a dongle to kind of some in some way for their deployment. So LT definitely would help in that and then, yeah that and very easily. Uh, in terms of the specific effort, kind of the areas of uh, three aspect of uh, use cases, I think the additional capacity and better coverage of the IoT deployment will definitely help, uh, both in terms of, uh, you know, kind of improve the streaming quality for the police as well as for enabling the uh, so real-time emulation aspect. Uh, also, something that's related uh, is that, um, you know, DOT, DOT is actually planning some large-scale uh, deployment in Southeast Michigan, so the planning essentially in terms of tens of thousands of vehicles will de be deployed and run experiments over there. So if you could have, uh, you know, so LT that can sort of help uh, with the integration within their effort. Um, so that's kind of the short term kind of in immediate benefit I think we can get. If you look into long term, longer term I think um, it could have a kind of good impact on the research and innovation in the connected vehicles and micro power grid. Because um, uh, actually, like, just like YMAX, LT is, uh, uh, is an integral, will be an integral part of the network solutions for connected vehicles, also for the uh, neighborhood area ne network of smart grid. So uh, with this, I think uh, with LT deployed uh, across the country, I think that would help uh, sort of push the, uh, stimulate the innovation in that context. Um, so that's some of the short-term benefit I think we have, we can have kind of from the LTE deployment. But there's one thing that I do want to see if uh, this may actually be feasible. Um, that is, so if you look at the deployment methodology, right, we can either use the, the sort of commercial IT equipment or we can actually use some open source uh, equipment, especially, especially for the base stations. So I think if we, while we're planning for this effort, if we can actually think about sort of open source sof software defined implementations of LTE, I think that would be of uh, great value. On one hand, um, for, for I think so a few reasons. On one hand, if you look at the, um, even though LTE is being sort of regarded as one of the promising solution, or part of the solution to some of the challenges in connect, connected vehicles and uh, smart grid, uh, I think by the, it was not designed for the real-time control purpose, actually. So I think there are probably, uh, there are areas, areas that need to kind of, uh, in terms of the design of the uh, technology, there are areas that probably can benefit from further investment. Um, so if we can have a software-defined uh, implementation, then we can potentially enable uh, sort of uh, uh, folks to play with uh, the, the hardware platform and then change how it behaves. Um, I guess another uh, benefit, if you can have software-defined platform, sort of more have, uh, have kind of uh, have that enabled is that we can actually potentially have both the, the commodity applications, the existing applications and research applications running at the same infrastructure. That could be a good kind of a proof of concept to the, those traditional communities like DOT uh, and sort of help them kind of understand, appreciate the, the value of uh, some of the actual concept that we have been working on over the past years. Uh, like you know, in the Gini community. Um, so I guess I'll skip some of the details, but essentially, um, so, so essentially, let me just give one, give one specific example. 
so earlier I mentioned the large scale deployment they're planning for Southeast Michigan and across the country. But if you look at the partner they will come, they're mostly you know, existing companies uh, who actually use existing solutions and, uh, and technologies. So that's probably good for the current short term goals, like for the coming like three or five years, but definitely it's not good for the sort of long term, long term evolution of the whole field. So if you can have uh, some prototype to kind of as a proof of concept to them so that they can actually trust us better as a way of uh, sort of having them listen to us. Um, so that's, um, so just a side note, we actually, uh, in this context, we have been actually also partly supported by Gini. We have been looking to this similar issue in the, uh, in the client side, that is on the sort of what you deploy in vehicles. So we looked at how you virtualize the platform so that they, essentially multiple users can use it at the same time. Um, also, we have uh, been developing a low-cost, high-performance SDR so that you can potentially scale, uh, deploy them at scale, even for academic uh, folks. Um, so, so in summary, I think, essentially, if, if, given that we have the opportunity of uh, think about LT deployment, I think there's uh, value to think about how we can actually leverage this opportunity to uh, sort of help uh, have uh, impact in other broad areas such as uh, those traditional citizen control systems. So that's it. I'm going to talk about a uh, project called PhantomNet that we're building at the University of Utah. Um, the PI of this project is actually Kobus van der Merve, who's not here today, so I can answer some questions about it, but I'm not the expert. Um, and the idea is that we're building an LTE testbed that is end-to-end -end programmable uh, from the you know, actual LTE through the core uh, and then out to the internet or cloud services, and this whole thing uh, is going to be kind of Emulab or protege style remotely accessible uh, from anywhere. So the deployment that we're doing at the University of Utah is going to be relatively small, um, but uh, uh, but will be you know kind of highly programmable throughout the entire uh, throughout the entire uh, uh, network that we're building. So the basic functionality is we're going to do um, we're doing a physical deployment of most of mobile devices and then a small cells uh, uh, of, of LTE base stations and then a, a backbone that is SDN capable and then hooked up to the, all of the cloud infrastructure that we have at uh, Utah in the form of Emulab and the other test beds that we've built. Um, and, then, uh, and then on the software side, uh, it's, this is run using the Emulab's control framework. It will, we expect, eventually be available uh, uh, you know, through Genie. Um, and uh, uh, working on a kind of a mobile network toolkit where the idea is we give you kind of all the basic pieces of uh, uh, an LTE slash EPC network um, and you can either kind of build the traditional one as it is today or you can replace any parts of it. So, uh, uh, so for example, you know, we have a, st a standard configuration, right, a standard 4G configuration that would have LTE for the radio access network an EPC on the, um, on, the, on the backbone piece here, uh, but then uh, give you the ability to replace some components, right? So, for example, if you want to come straight off the NOB into a software-defined network, or if you want to do something like the cloudlet work or the soft cell work that uh, uses software-defined networking in the core, give you enough control and flexibility to do uh, uh, all of that. Um, so the status is that we have a basic 
Um, uh, we, we have the basic thing up and running. This is project is only, a, is only actually started a couple months ago. Um, so uh, uh, at the moment, we're using, we have, we, have, we have kind of two things that are up and running. So one is you can build something that's purely in, so op I should mention, so OpenEPC is a software package that is kind of open uh, in the sense that you can, uh, buy, you can buy a source license from them, which we have. Uh, and, in, you know, and, it's, and it is a, you know, model, uh, it, it, it has implementations of many pieces of the EPC core that's typically used with LTE networks. Um, so we have, we have, a, we have, we have, we have one uh, uh, kind of running environment that is uh, kind of, you know, built with OpenEPC and uses an, emu uses an emulation for the, for the radio access link, so it's not an actual wireless link. Uh, and uh, essentially we have a, a working NS, emulate NS file, you can swap it in, it has a whole bunch of options you can set at the top, and you get in a working EPC network uh, at the end. Um, and it actually, you know, we have full end-to-end -end connectivity working through it. Um, and it's not currently externally available. We're expecting that that will happen like by the end of next month. Um, and then more recently, as like just last week, we have um, some of the hardware radio of the radio access network uh, working now. So uh, we have this little lab set up where we have a, an actual UE and an actual ENOD, and they're actually not going to antennas, they're going to a wire at the moment. Um, but uh, we can actually talk from this LTE, uh, uh, you know, USB modem through uh, uh, through LTE through an EPC network and then out to the internet and you know, like fetch Google Pages and stuff from from something that's going to our network. Um, and and then it's and then and then the, the actual uh, Open EPC part is running inside of Emulab. And you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we want to enable here is we think that there's a lot of interest in connecting cloud services and SDN services to, uh, uh, to you know, various mobile networks. And, uh, uh, and, and this stuff is connected to the entire Emulad testbed and then transitively uh, from there to basically all of Zoom. Um, and uh, yeah, and we're, 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 we're working hard on making it actually externally available. And I'm gonna be short, so I'll stop there. a little bit here and, and sort of move from talking about uh, things that are ongoing to uh, plans for the future. And to set the stage for that, um, I asked uh, Dave Farber if he'd say sort of a few words about how we think about uh, the research challenges that are confronting us, how we coordinate that with sort of the, the realities of the, the commercial space uh, that surrounds us. You know, Dave has a, a tremendous amount of experience in, in doing both of these. And I think maybe he can uh, kick us off with some challenges, um, after which um, Ivana and Manu are going to get up and talk a little bit about uh, you know, some plans, and we hopefully still have some time for discussion. So I'll stop uh, in, in service of that last goal. Up to you. Can everybody, does that work? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to paste this on so I don't drop it. Maybe I'll paste it on. There we go. I do love technology when it doesn't work. There we go. Okay. Uh, I wanted to spend a few minutes sort of giving a, uh, a feeling for some of the challenges and some of the opportunities. Uh, you know, people have tried for a number of years to bring uh, wireless technology into the academic world in particular. And usually the problem you run into outside of Wi-Fi is the commercial sector and the FCC and the licensing requirements and more and more as the FCC looks at uh, software defined radios, uh, the ability to certify that they will not somehow jam the airways and cause problems to people. That's an open question. I haven't seen any very good answers to that, but people tend to be a little shy. On the other hand, some carriers are willing to experiment. Um, when I first got to Pittsburgh, 
I actually convinced Verizon that they should install an LTE network in Pittsburgh, which was not on the initial list, and put it on campus also and allow the campus to experiment, given they didn't interfere in a meaningful way with the commercial LTE network, in which case we could experiment on that and experiment with students and researchers. And I think it's important uh, as you are on, a, on an academic campus to stimulate the students to experiment, not only in hardware, not only in software, but applications, and sort of stimulate the, their interest in seeing things happen in this space. I'll just mention a few things that I think are critical and then make a comment at the end. Security and privacy are, are going to be the main problem, one of the main problems in the future of wireless. Uh, right now, our cell phones are arguably not very secure and not very private. Uh, we would like to see phones, devices that have much better privacy mechanisms. And there are phones being manufactured in some places with things like the, the TPM modules inside, which give you the opportunity potentially to do some interesting work. Uh, and some uh, research work in that area. I think security is a major uh, problem in the wireless space. I also think that seamless transitions are another thing which certainly the carriers have done fairly well. Uh, we haven't done it as well in the data space. Uh, for as long as I can remember, there has been protocols to do that, but somehow they never got implemented correctly. So as I walk from Wi-Fi coverage, TLT coverage, uh, all hell breaks loose quite often. And that's something that limits our flexibility in being able to deploy meaningful environments on the campuses. I'm going to suggest a, a path. Uh, <coughs> in spite of uh, normally uh, belief that the carriers are completely insensitive to the need for experimentation. I think we can work with them, and I think potentially we can work with the FCC to get some dedicated frequency, maybe some dedicated devices, maybe some insulation of our local LTE networks. I would argue, though, from listening to what I've heard to, so far today, that we'd make a mistake if we just built yet another LTE network. I mean, that's very nice. There are cities which, have done, which will do that. There are Wi-Fi buses, a whole set of things. I don't consider, I'm going to step on a few toes. I don't consider that research. Okay? I think we have to move the field forward. Unless we move the field forward, we're not doing our job. Okay? Uh, I'm going to shut up for <coughs> before my throat gives out. I think the charge is to do research, to find things that are not going to be done in the commercial area, to push that technology forward to the point where the carriers and others look at it and say, why don't we do it that way? In which case, we made a contribution. One final thing, um, fifth generation is coming fast, and I think we at least want to monitor that. And one final comment, if I may. Uh, one thing I notice, and this is maybe systemic in the U.S. more than some places, is we don't look at what other countries have done. Uh, Japan has done a huge amount in the wireless uh, space, vehicle to vehicle, et cetera. I haven't heard very much comparison or, or uh, absorption of that technology into the, our research aims. I've seen some things which are almost duplicates of it, which sort of bothers me. Other countries have done some very good stuff, and we should be monitoring what they're doing and advancing from that point. Uh, final comment, and uh, a good friend of mine, Dick Hamming, most of you know him as from Hamming Codes, but he was actually a brilliant numerical analyst, analyst. Uh, once put it nicely, I think it was Galois who said, I'm a great mathematician because I've stood on the shoulders of those who preceded me. He said, in computer science, we stand on each other's toes. I don't think we want to do that. Okay.
the right point to end the story. Um, so, so what I want to really talk about is um, where we are right now as far as Gini Wireless is concerned, at least, at least as far as WiMAX goes, and, and what are the immediate next steps that we can see happening, uh, and maybe talk about what would be nice to have on top of it. So if you look at the latest incarnation of the um, WiMAX deployment, it looks pretty much like this, right? So the base station is somewhere um, above the, the, the uh, sorry, the, below the controller. There is the IRF aggregate manager, which enables us to play with the base station itself. There is a data path is fully under software-defined networking control, and we connect to the rest of the gene. Now, some of you have this deployment. Some of you have the older one, which is more traditional click-based. Um, regardless, the data path itself, I think, is well understood, and we pretty much know how to play with it, whether it's a local scale or much, much larger scale, including the full-blown gene, right? And we have examples of projects that use the data path capabilities of Genie in both wireless and wired world. Um, what most of you don't know is that we have the same thing for LTE as well. Now, as opposed to trying to work with OpenETC, and we did try, but there are all sorts of licensing issues which we just simply cannot solve. By the way, OpenETC is done by Fraunhofer, and it's everything but open. But that's a, they, they took the title. They, I can believe they even have a trademark on it. So, you know, it's hopeless. We can't take that anymore. There is a really, truly open source version of, of EPC software out there in, in the, but it's not yet contained and not good enough to, to sort of be deployed on a large scale. But rather than doing that, and I'm, I'm sort of um, somewhat heretically against the LTE network as is, um, what we are trying to do is to sort of replace all of this with the same thing that we have for the WIMAX. And believe it or not, there are a couple of much more serious players than us trying to do exactly the same, right? And this exists right now for two types of base stations. One is the IP access, the other one is the uh, airspan. And when I say it exists, it barely works, okay? Because there is a fairly complex set of issues related to that link over there. Um, we just have a basic X1 implementation so that the base station doesn't collapse. Uh, but, you know, the whole idea is really to put the open, uh, put the software-defined networking in the data part of LTE, let the controller figure out what it wants to do with the, with the packets, regardless of what they are, and um, the rest supposedly we know how to do, right? It's connected to Genie, everybody's happy. What I really want to talk mostly today about is what do we do with the control? And those are those... Uh, multicolored boxes on the top, right? And I absolutely agree that we, unless we can come up with a better idea of how to do that control, it's pretty much a useless exercise in uh, extending LTE to do a few more things on the, on the data path. Now, larger picture, um, the idea, of course, is that the Genie controller of some kind um, is in charge of coordinating multiple base stations. There is some magic... Uh, related to data path, and, and by the way, that, that stuff up there really exists, and you know, it's, it's really not that hard to create a single SDN controller that's gonna control the data path in, within the base station as well as uh, with all the switches and, and all the other infrastructure the Genie has. Where we just have a very basic, a very rudimentary support is on these two green boxes on the side. And if you think about it, um, in, in WiMAX world, we do, I believe, we do understand the control, right? At least as far as commercial base stations are concerned. In a sense that, you know, we can play with the rates, we can play with the power, we can play with all sorts of other things. Which means that we can, um, and depends on who wants to do that research, do fully programmable green boxes that will play with the radio resource management, even do some fancy joint control between Wi-Fi, WiMAX, and LTE, if needed, um, and of course, certainly do everything on the application level. That's for sure. Um, the question is, can we do something on the real, real control level? Meaning, can we replace the actual controller in the base station? And so to that extent, I want to talk a little bit about um, 
where we are going or where we are trying to go at the moment, right? Um, so the idea is, of course, um, we all know what the software defined networking does on the data path or a data path or for data path. Can we do something on the control side? And um, of course, um, why not just extend the existing software defined concept to the control? There are a lot of problems. I don't want to go into them, but you know, just a sort of a laundry list of what we really want to in, in a test bed like Genie or in wireless part of Genie enable is sort of capability to play with both centralized and decentralized control. Uh, it's not clear that, I mean, the major cost of wireless system is in the fact that it's a centralized control system, right? If you can distribute the, the control somehow magically and, and make sure it still works, you could probably make it much, much cheaper, right? If you really look at the deployment, the base station, one base station, uh, for a cost of the software infrastructure, you can buy today uh, approximately between 50 and 100 base stations. Right? So the hardware itself is trivial compared to the cost of software. And of course, for us, even more important is that you're getting a black box in the software like OpenAPC. I mean, yes, you can modify it, I agree, but you know, it's, it's sort of pretty much under control of one group and how it performs and what it does. So I don't want to spend too much time. I actually have a three slides to sort of um, point out three different ways of thinking about this a notion of extending software-defined networking principles onto the control plane of wireless systems. Um, distributed control plane. The first thing that we need to establish is the shared state. And, and it's not clear how do, what is needed. Do I really need to share the state of wireless station in, base station in New Jersey with the wireless base station in, in LA, right? Probably not. Uh, the only thing I really need to share is the authenticated information for, for devices that are coming from New Jersey and are showing up in LA or maybe some handoff information if, if, or, or registration information and things like that. So the issue becomes uh, what is the shared state for the control part of the wireless system? The second one is um, what if I have specialized controllers? This is what we really, if you really look at any scientific paper, it talks about specialized control. Nobody tries to do overall control over a wireless system. At least I haven't seen a paper like that. It's typically a paper about radio resource management or a scheduler in the base station or some other fairly isolated aspect of the problem, right? Can we design a system that um, allows us to create these multiple controllers and then tie it all together using a same or a single framework um, into a, into a something that sort of works. And remember, we always are only claiming it sort of works, right? We are not trying, aim is here not to create a production system and replace, and, and replace the <coughs> AT&T or, or Verizon. And then of course, if you push that con context into, into large, large scale, can you do this on a, on a um, sort of hierarchical uh, distributed system with lots of controllers that are somehow magically and I, you know, I'll be happy to talk to anybody who really uh, has a problem with this because there are a lot of issues here that naturally are not easy to do and, and you know, a lot of real, real serious problems and it's not clear that you can actually even do it. But you know, um, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's challenging. Right? And then the last slide, and this is really the last slide, and we, a couple of people touched here already on the subject. Um, what kind of wireless systems are we really trying to build? Are we trying to improve LT? Are we trying to build completely new systems? We know, and everybody has their own fully programmable devices. There are now, especially today, infinite number of devices that are infinitely more capable than typical base station is. Um, and while those are beautiful, it's very uh, unlikely that we will ever be able to follow the pace of innovation in the device on a device level as a research project. By the time we acquire a certain device, it's already obsolete. And the guy in three months will show up with much faster FPGA with you know, six times number of, the ga of gates and, and, and stuff like that. Plus, whatever we get in this realm, right, is gonna have these problems. 
Um, you know, I, I love, we, we are right now in the middle of the finals of a DARPA Spectrum Challenge. And USRPs are the best known platform there is. There is a huge support for software of all kinds for USRP platform. People who are you know, participating in, in Spectrum Challenge are probably people who know the most about, I mean, who would, right, who would participate unless they're really confident they can do something. And I can see, I can tell you that half of the designs fail. They just simply fail, they don't work, right? And the reason why they don't work is because the complexity is such that it's very, very hard to get it done properly with the limited resources that typical researchers have, right? I'm sure if you, know, if you invest enormous amount of money into pl supporting particular type of, of platform, we could get something useful out of it. And yes, we all use, uh, there are actually, I believe, three LTE base stations that are soft, only software-based LTE base stations. We have one. And yes, you can bring it up on a large number of devices, everything is fine. But that is far from being able to modify and, and play with it as a, as a proper research platform because of all these issues. And this is where I would stop, and I guess now we have maybe some time for, for questions, answers, stuff like that. As um, the base station as the resource or the, or the cellular and devices as your resource? Because so far all I've seen is that the control and everything stops at the base station. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to ask about your uh, base station. So it seems like your, your architecture is about taking base stations that talk the 3GPP um, EPC protocol stuff and then creating a wrapper around them. Are you do, you, do you have any plans to do anything more deep on the base station itself or to replace a base station with something like USRP? I can yell, it's not a problem. Uh, it is a fundamental problem of, are we building a test bed where you want client devices, millions of them, to do stuff? Or are we building a test bed that's gonna develop next generation of wireless systems? These are two completely different test beds. They have nothing to do with each other. I mean, they have something to do with each other, but you know, the, the, the divide is much, much deeper than, than just you know, putting some devices, putting some programmable platforms putting some software together. I mean, to me, for instance, all the, I've, I've seen the failures where you give people devices because they don't want to carry two devices. Everybody has their own phone. Would you agree to carry two phones just because somebody wants you to do measurements? I mean, I do it, but you know, because I write papers myself. If there were no paper for me in this, I wouldn't carry anything. I want to, uh, let me just, you said something that sort of triggered something in my mind, um, and that's the difficulty of building hardware, redesigning hardware in the academic community, basically. Uh, now, we faced the same thing in the gigabit test bed a long time ago, and what we did was recruit industry uh, to do that, and it strikes me that there were a couple of potential industrial players, research industrial players that might be interested in joining this one. Obviously, one comes to mind called Google, which has, both ca which has that capability. So that may be a very productive way of joining the imagination of, um, of academia with the practicality of being able to contract or build stuff and also play politics, which is... Yeah. But I can't think of any who would be interested.
interested in the like deep wireless programmability vision. I mean, who's doing that now? Depends that on who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I mean, I feel like most industry partners are kind of moving away from that and kind of letting other people take care of it. I think, I think companies like Google have an approach more to software. So, so we, we did have some discussion with Google on the Genie deployment, actually. And Google is pretty much interested in it. The only problem is that Google doesn't really want to disclose, A, what they're doing and what, you know, they think we should be doing. So uh, that's, a, that's a tricky part. Can and I can tell, I know some things about what Google is doing, but, you know, uh, they really don't like us talking about it. But even then, like, are they interested in the vision of, like, a giant test bed or the vision of, like, programming? The, the Both. Really? Both. Both. Take them both of you on. Well, <clears throat> you know, I was actually thinking about Google myself, and probably many of the people in the room were as well. You know, I think if you went to Google and you could say, we can give you something like three cities or four cities, something like that, and have a good way of partitioning between the Google private experiments they're doing and the open academic experiments, which I believe you can do with your mechanisms, that might be really interesting, right? It's like having a Google wired city only at a, at a wireless scale. So, so, so just to add, um, I know for a fact that Google is heavily deploying, and I won't deny I said this even if it's broadcasted and recorded, <laughs> uh, on their campus, uh, uh, the, the sort of TDD-based LT system. Uh, there's one other thing that I think should be maybe a source of uh, some input. Not, I'm not necessarily recommending it, but Internet2 has been talking about massive deployment of wireless technology as part of their Internet2 environment. Uh, they've been talking, I've been told they're talking to a lot of carriers. I have no idea how adventurous those guys can be. I know Internet2 and they don't tend to be that adventurous. But there may be a deal to be made there because they have a huge potential market there. So, so if I may go back to your comment on, it's absolute, absolutely impossible to kind of integrate, you know, really deep programmability of uh, the research platform versus uh, sort of large scale deployment. I think there may be scenarios where we can actually kind of ha try to have the benefit of both worlds, right? For example, if you think about vehicles, um, you know, many people own it for many years, and sometimes that time span actually is longer than the life of standards sometimes in our world, right, in the IT world. So, so I think there's potentially motivation for, for, the, for them to think about uh, a sort of uh, a platform that can evolve itself so that you can get benefit of the technology. So that in 10 years, you know, I, I, I buy a car today, I don't have to live with the technology for another 10 or 20 years. Uh, now, I think another similar relative thought is that if I understand right, I think one of the dream of Genie was to really develop a, a sort of the type of technology or methodology so that a production system is a test bed itself, right? I think that's still worthwhile to pursue, even in the wireless context. And even though maybe there are all kinds of challenges, but I think. Uh, there may still be opportunities where this would actually help a lot. I absolutely, but I, I arguably that's the part of, you know, let's buy LT base station, modify the software as much as we can, but still keep it carrier grade and make sure it's not going to crash. And, and, you know, with, well, like, like it does with, with what we do anyway. But, uh, I mean, that's, I think that's part of the problem. If you really want to use the devices that are carrier grade devices, then you're Pro deep programmability pretty much goes away. At scale, at scale. If you want to do one or two, I'm sure you can do it. But if you are talking about 50 sites and, and you know, I mean, that's good luck. Ivan, I have a question to you. Why you don't uh, consider the opportunity to uh, have a wireless controller, controller to the wireless network, just as application to the uh, um, let me say, um, as then controller, 
which will control in this case as wired network as wireless. And in, on this way, you can make the software of the base station much uh, easier. Uh, and um, you also will win uh, a lot of delays and uh, make, um, uh, how to say, uh, smooth roaming across the network. So, so if you look at the slide, that's exactly what Maybe we're I proposing it. to build. Okay. And you know, there, but there are a lot of problems there as well. I mean, if you look at the control path, latency plays a critical role. There are certain things you have to be close to the base station. Um, you know. I come to come to the evening. I will show you something. Sure. Um, so I just wanted to close the idea. The reason I wanted to push off questions to the end was because we had this story in mind when we started, and Mark alluded to it at the start, and I just want to reinforce the point while we close, that we actually started this, uh, we started this thought process to move towards LTE as being the most emerging technology coming forward, and I wanted to showcase the, the work that has been done in the past that is very commendable, and I definitely wanted to touch on SciWiNet, uh, wanted to touch on the applications that have been really successful in M Wisconsin, Madison, and uh, in Wayne State. And these are just representative, a very small subset of what has actually happened uh, over the past two, three years. And the idea was to build on top of this, and then building on top of uh, the deprogrammability that was presented by Rob and Yvonne. I think it's an exciting time uh, for us to think about uh, moving to the future and sort of, uh, pun not attended, but think about a broader vision for Genie Wireless. So I thank you all for coming here, and I hope to see you at demo night. Thank you very much.